All right, everybody, uh, we're back with just uh, one more game here in the double Mushana. Um, the main point of this game is literally just to make the point that uh, in my game that I showed with Record, when Black left the pawn on c5, did not react to my b4 break, uh, the, the wrong approach was for me to go in and play b4, b5, uh, allowing Black's knight to come into the a5 square. This is <clears throat> an opportunity uh, that I had to uh, correct this in my play um, <clears throat> and stick to the strategy of leaving the tension between the b4 and uh, b5 uh, the b4 and c5 pawns and just trying to create a second front somewhere um so you'll notice here black plays the move order knight g to e7 um it's less common i don't know that it's actually less good um <clears throat> the uh it, it has its own set of ideas uh, in particular black might play b6 and then try to break with d5 uh, which is a very interesting try um, I played pawn to g3. Um, I wasn't necessarily intending to follow up with f4. I thought maybe I would end up playing some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of eight pawns. Um, <clears throat> so I hadn't already decided at this point that we were going into double Mushana. Uh, black played g6, which to me looked slow because... Um, if I were black, if, if I'm playing the knight on GD7 move order, I'm probably trying to create something in the center. Um, so I went ahead, since everything's looking a little bit slow, I decided to go ahead and try to push on the Shaw side. Uh, pawn to H6, this also looked like a slow move, so I felt I was free to go ahead and create my push. Uh, black plays B6, I played pawn to B4, black plays rook B8. Um, and since everything's looking so slow for black, you know, I thought, okay, well, you know, why not go ahead and try to bring this rook into the game? So I play, uh, pawn to h3, uh, which is a move that I actually, I immediately regretted when black then played pawn to f5, because when black played pawn to f5, I thought, okay, well, now I have to play a double Mushana. But um, I didn't really feel like having the h3, g3 uh, weaknesses. I would have rather had my pawn on h2 so that my Furzan would be able to block uh, all play on the Furzan side, uh, as I've shown in my other lectures. Um, of course, I, I guess I could have ignored this all and, and not played f4. Maybe, the, maybe I could have just played rook h2. Um, but I also didn't want to be completely behind on space. Um, you know, if white never plays the pawn to f4, uh, then black often will have pawn to g5, knight g6, particularly in these structures with a knight on e7. Black will be able to eventually maybe make the f4 push himself, uh, particularly if he gets a little bit of help from a rook left. So... Uh, I, I didn't want to be too far behind on space, so I did go ahead and go into double Mujana. Uh Black immediately broke with g5, which is uh, which is fine. Um, certainly, it's not a bad move. Black should do something to try to create some space, and, and g5 is uh, more useful when White has played h3, since it's a little bit harder to just completely gum up the works on the first hand side. So g5 is a good move. I played knight to g3, or sorry, knight to f3. Uh, black exchanged, which uh, makes sense. Uh, black could also play rook to g8 first, um, but I probably respond with rook to h2. It probably doesn't matter much. Um, uh, so we exchanged, and then there was a slight inaccuracy on black's part uh, with bringing the furs in immediately to f7. Um, this Furzan isn't going anywhere. Uh, 
The pawn on h3 completely shuts it out of g4, so it doesn't have any future on the Ferzian side. Um, Black could maybe play uh, e5 and bring the Ferzian here, but this is very ambitious given that Black is already starting, starting down a tempo um, and White's already achieved the b4 break, so uh, it, it's unlikely to ever work. Um, so just for instance, after rook to h2, which is what I played, if Black were to try the e4 break here, um, there could be issues with something as simple as f takes. Uh, and now if um, Black plays pawn takes, uh, we've seen this idea before, I've mentioned it, um, White will have a bunch of exchanges, and at the end of it, he wins the pawn on e5. Uh, it's it's possible that with some tricky move ordering, uh, Black will be able to get out of losing a pawn, maybe after F takes. Uh, maybe the right move is to play C takes and, and hit White's knight. Um, and, but even if we just ignore all the tactics and, and Black and White plays uh, the exchange, um, Black's in a lot of trouble here. Uh, because if he recaptures with the e-pawn, white will have b5, hitting this knight uh, and winning the pawn, uh, which means that black would have to play knight takes. <clears throat> and uh, with the isolated pawns uh, all over the place, this is truly a horrible kind of position for black, uh, and, and white would have the two center pawns. So... Um, something like knight to d4 here uh, would put black, black under a tremendous amount of pressure. So, um, <clears throat> so there, there's not really any real hope that black will be the one to achieve this break, which means that bringing the Furzan uh, to f7 is uh, not not a very productive move. Um, which should Black have played well? Black should just go ahead and see his, the G file right away. Um, if I play Rook to H2, which is probably what I would have done, uh, Black probably goes Rook G3. Um, and, and the idea with this, well, the, the Black Rook isn't getting anywhere. White's going to play something like King to E2, and then um, play the Furs and F2, or even just the king to f2. So black will have to retreat, probably to the seventh rank, uh, and will lose some time that way. But um, black has prevented white from connecting his rooks, getting that rook over to b2, uh, which is what white wanted. So, um, and certainly if black ends up uh, convincing white to go ahead and take a pair of rooks off of the board, um, Black's chances of just simply surviving this and making a draw uh, go up, you know, go up fourfold. I mean, it, it, if these rooks come off, so, you know, if White played rook to g1 here, uh, Black will be able to make a draw this way. Um, White's winning chances are, are very, very low if that second pair of rooks, if that first pair of rooks comes off the board. So, um, Rook to g8 would be uh, a, a good move here. Uh, and you notice, again, if the pawn were on h2, then white would simply run the furs into g3, uh, and then white has all day to play any rook lifts he wants. Uh, black is going to be making zero progress. But um, it's a little bit harder to make progress on this side. So... Uh, with a pawn being on h3, um, and uh, white's not going to have time to complete the rook lift, uh, which leaves black in um, much better shape than uh, he would be normally. So, um, you know, that's that's why uh, this move order for white in the uh, going into the double Mujano with a pawn on h3 maybe wasn't the most accurate uh, move order. Um, and uh, after rook to g8, black has decent chances of making a draw. Um, 
Instead, after the uh, Farzan came to F7, this gave me time to swing the rook over. So I went ahead and, and uh, swung the rook over. Uh, you'll notice I'm not repeating my mistake against Rook Quadra. I'm not playing pawn to b5, uh, which would simply allow the knight to come to a5, and at some point, black is going to be able to bring his elephant in uh, and create pressure against the c4 pawn. So that that is the main reason I want to show this game, is that here I tried something else, and, and it worked much better. So black played rook to g8, as you'd expect. Uh, I went ahead and brought a rook over. Now you'll see white is starting to make some threats. I'm going to play b takes c5, uh, and then I'm going to be able to launch uh, some pressure down the b file. Uh, so um, rook to g3, okay, black creates a, a threat of his own, and, and but I just respond to that. Uh, the move rook to g3 has lost most of its sting because white has had time to get that rook to b2. Um, so at this point, white has a clear advantage. Uh, black played rook to g2, but this isn't doing anything. The first hand comes to f2. Um, really, there's uh, not not a lot of play going on for black. Um, and if you notice, his rooks are uh, completely uncoordinated. Black played rook to b7, hoping to try eventually maybe to coordinate the rooks, but there's a lot of pieces gumming up the works on the seventh rank. Um, here, probably, uh, my guess is b takes c5 would have been the most precise move, uh, forcing black, because of the pin, to take away from the center. Um, this leaves black's king a little bit exposed, uh, and white at some point is going to have the opportunity to play e4 or d4, try to break this open. Um, and uh, um, so that that exchange is possible. I wanted to go ahead and consolidate my position on the first hand side, um, and so I went ahead and kicked the rook out. Uh, I played knight to h4. I mean, just a little bit of technical difficulty there. It seems to have frozen up. Oh, page is unresponsive. I will go ahead and refresh. Um, so while we're waiting for that, the uh, the main idea that I had here, wanted to try to kick the rook out of uh, the g2 square. Um, and just kind of keep pushing uh, and, you know, have ideas of just continuing to open different fronts. Having a little little technical trouble with that, so I'm going to try just starting the game again in a new tab. Okay. All right. So black has played rook to b7. I play knight to h4, I go ahead and kick this out, rook comes back to the seventh rank, um, and, he, and here I played a move uh, that I, I thought was kind of interesting, I played king to f3. Um, white really does have time to play a move like this if he wants to. Uh, my idea is, is kind of clever, so I'm trying to open up a second front uh, this is something I discussed in my previous lectures. Instead of playing a move like pawn to b5, which shuts down the Shaw side, uh, and instead of going for the jugular on the Shaw side, white should try to create a second front somewhere. And and so this is the second front that I thought I was creating, uh, and, and it seemed to have worked in this game. I'm threatening, well, threatening, uh, knight to e2, knight to g3, and then putting pressure on the f5 pawn, um, and, and at some point I'm hoping to play rook d2, d4, bishop d3, and completely surround this pawn on f5. 
right. so that is the goal. Um, I'm playing a little bit of siege warfare against the f5 point, and by having the king on f3, I'm completely ensuring the safety of my own f4 point. So uh, the king does very well on f3 uh, in terms of uh, it never really comes under attack. It's a perfectly safe position. Um, black played knight to g6, and as you'll remember in shot tranche, uh, this is true in regular chess too. You you don't want to trade pieces a lot of the times, uh, particularly if you have a space advantage. But uh, in Chatrange, you you always want to avoid the exchange of pieces. Um, the goal of the game in Chatrange, you just have to keep maneuvering. Um, so knight to g2, this knight on g6 isn't going anywhere now. Um, my knight on g2 is it's kind of a funny placed piece, but it does keep an eye on the center, and uh, and it it'll come back into the game eventually. Black swivels his knight, cd7. Now I went for my plan. I'm coming in this way, even uh, now that there's not the possibility of black getting the furzan to g6. This uh, knight g3, knight h5 maneuver is stronger. Um, black keeps maneuvering. And, and now I, I took a look. This is when I decide to break open the Shaw side. Uh, and my reasoning was this, uh, look at all of these pieces on the Furzan side. With all of Black's forces essentially on the Furzan side, now after knight to g8, I didn't want to wait around for Black to play knight f6 and, and reconsolidate the position uh, or to get any more forces back into the game. I said, now I'm going to make this exchange, having started to amass forces on the Furzan side um, <clears throat> and, and lured Black into bringing more pieces over there. And, and you can see the point with Knight to G8. It's, it's pretty clear that the reason Black played this maneuver of bringing the Knight all the way this way was the idea that when I played Knight to G3, Getting ready to come into the h5 square, black would be able to play knight to f6. Um, but uh, now that I've lured all of the pieces away, I, I play b takes c5, and I start a uh, shaw side attack. And and at this point, it's devastating because none of the pieces are able to come to black's aid here. Um, uh, I played the pawn up to a4. This is something that uh, just was never possible when there was a knight sitting on c6 to guard the a5 square or to jump into the b4 square. Um, now it's very hard. Uh, Black probably does have uh, an opportunity here to defend uh, by playing bishop to d6. This is what he has to do. Uh, white plays pawn to a5, and, and now Black can go ahead and stick a uh, a bishop on b4. But it, it's not so easy. If you look, you see that the c5 pawn uh, is always going to be under attack. Uh, white could just continue with bishop to a3. Um, and the next move is going to be d4. Uh, white has all of the pawn levers. This uh, elephant sitting out on b4, and this pawn on c5 are huge targets. Um, and it, it's not clear that black has any good way to continue trying to defend these. So, for instance, um, uh, you know, if, white, if black plays knight to f8 with the idea of after pawn to d4, maybe playing the knight to d7 to try to hold uh, this position, um, this isn't going to work after just exchange, exchange, uh, white plays, uh, bishop takes c5. Um, this entire position is, is just crumbling. So, uh, so black does have some defensive idea, but it's, it's probably too little too late because everybody is on the wrong side of the board. Uh, knight to f6, 
now I just will play uh, pawn to a5. Um, King c7, this, this looks like it might work. Uh, probably knight to d7 was necessary here uh, for the defense. Uh, as we'll see, this, this doesn't end up working for black. Um, I'm putting pressure on c5. Uh, again, knight to d7 probably is necessary. This isn't pleasant, though, for black. Um, white has different ideas, maybe knight to c5 and knight b5, but uh, probably more direct is just to go ahead and play d4. Uh, and black's position is uh, in dire straits. These rooks are disconnected, and white is threatening to just make a, a direct assault basically on black's king position um so uh not surprisingly at this point uh my opponent cracked king to c6 looks like it's holding c5 uh but uh ultimately it doesn't uh, i just played bishop takes c5 I, I go ahead and i lure the king all the way out uh, to this position and then knight to d4. So now I'm starting to create a, a kind of a mating net almost scenario. Um, and, and this b6 pawn is falling. Uh, and, and, and it's really not easy to find a way to hold black's position together. Uh, maybe knight to d7 was a try. Uh, Looking at it, that's, that's probably the best that uh, that Black can do. All those positions still very passive. Uh, Black tried to connect his rooks in the game, tried to bring this rook over to defend. Uh, but what ends up happening here is I play rook to b5, king d6. Uh, okay, c5 check. Maybe that's a little gratuitous. I can also just win the pawn, but okay, c5. Uh, and at, at this point, uh, faced with the threat of me crashing down on b6, uh, black played b takes c5 and gave up the exchange. Uh, but really, this is at this point, this is game. Um, there's no way that black is going to be able to hold this. Um, I just proceeded to win uh, some material, drop the rook back. Uh, as is typical in these kinds of end games, you know, the thing you want to do once you've consolidated your other advantages is to go ahead and just march a first hand into the opponent's position. Uh, and, well, maybe for a few moves I'd been, maybe I'd been missing this move, rook to b6, but uh, okay, I guess I eventually find it. So rook to b6 and, and the knight drops, so... Uh, so there's nothing left uh, at that point. So uh, just to give a quick recap of this game, uh, we saw the interesting idea with a knight coming to g7. Uh, not necessarily a bad idea. Um, uh, I, I ended up being a, a little bit miffed at myself when I ended up going into double Mujana and I had the pawn on h3 when I didn't really want to have it there. Um, Black had one opportunity uh, to equalize, which uh, was to bring the rook over to g8. I'm not sure if it's full equality, um, but uh, but it's probably close. Um, <clears throat> and, and you know that being because uh, probably I have some move order issues to work out. Uh, but when we reached this position uh, here, White had a clear advantage. Um, the attempts to break through on the Shaw side didn't do anything. Uh, White was able to consolidate this position, avoid exchanges, uh, open up a second front by attacking on the Ferzan side, and then uh, was able to push forward uh, and ultimately crack this uh, Shaw side uh, set of defenses here uh, and win the game. So. Uh, very different from my game with Requadra and, and hopefully showing uh, some ways in which I improved the strategy after that game.